Live by Live has all of your favorite music, and you can listen for free. Whether you hit play on one of our hundreds of curated music stations or create your own custom artist radio station, you'll find the music you love on Live by Live. Visit LiveXLive.com or search LiveXLive in the App Store or Google Play and listen for free now. Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hi, this is Kelly. And this is Jenna. And you're listening to ODFM. This episode is One Denim from Murder. First, I'm going to tell you about the Columbia River Gorge. Are you familiar Ooh. with the Columbia River Gorge? I've heard of it, but I have not been there. I don't. I actually got to visit once. <gasps> One time I went to the West Coast. Ooh. One time. Okay. It is a canyon of the Columbia River, which forms the boundary between the states of Washington and Oregon. Oh, okay. It is this gorgeous, scenic location. I was there in the fall, so I also got to see it with like changing leaves and stuff but it's this huge canyon and the river is at the bottom and you can see for miles and it's Mm. just breathtaking and so it's a huge uh place for like tourists who are visiting portland to go to the gorge is over 80 miles long holy balls Uh uh-huh and it spans from rainforests in the west all the way to dry grasslands in the east so it like covers this huge territory And on the Oregon side, there is the old scenic highway, which kind of twists and turns through the forest Uh, and kind of follows along. And it goes past all these breathtaking waterfalls, the Uh, Multnomah Falls, that giant waterfall you see everywhere. I got to see that, too. Uh, I walked on the bridge across it, but I am um, afraid of heights. And so I really don't remember because I'm pretty sure the entire time I just had like a massive death tight grip. I had a death grip on my friend in front of me. And I'm pretty sure I had my eyes closed the whole time. It was just like, let me know when we're over. So, I did not enjoy this at no, all. I, it was not fun. I felt like I had to do it, but it was not fun at all. Right. Uh, I get it. No, I kind of feel that way when I'm on a bridge driving a car. Like, oh. Yeah, but you can't close gonna, your eyes. I know if this is going to go do it fast. Cause <laughs> right. Oh, God. So it was, I mean, and I went, when I saw this, I was, I think it was just before you and I met. So I was in my early 20s. Oh, sweet. When I went out there. So this was a while ago. And I mean, I was not nearly as into true crime as I am now. Had I known, this would have had a completely different significance to me. Ooh. Because not only is it a gorgeous spot for sightseeing and enjoying nature and hiking and all that. It's a popular place to dump a body. <gasps> oh, like, wow. Really popular. So, well, you would think with all the tourists around, that would be harder. Of course, I guess You would at night. think, but it's very, I mean, there, it's so, there's Pretty woods remote. and twists and turns uh, and it's just, you know. Okay. So actually, <clears throat> if you Googled Columbia River Gorge body found, mm-hmm. which I Uh-oh. did, okay. you would get multiple hits just from 2021 alone. <gasps> Whoa. Like, there's a lot of bodies oh, found there. Oh, shit. Okay. Ew. Today, though, we're going to talk about a body that was found in January of 1990. So we're going to go back mm. a little ways. Okay. But but this hasn't stopped anyone from using it yeah. as a as a it's dumping like, ground. You know what? This is the best bot I've heard, so I'm just going to continue. Right. I mean, these are just the ones they found. Tradition. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because the mini soda I'm, I was going to tell you about has to do with water, too. Ooh. Ooh. Anyway. On the morning of Monday, January 22nd, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Department received a call about a body found at the Columbia River Gorge, which I'm sure they weren't They're like, shocked yep. about at all. They're like, I got, got it. I got another one, Bill. Whose exactly. turn is it? And they do the rock, paper, scissors. That's exactly yeah. <laughs> the, the thing I watched. The guy was like, yep, I just happened to grab this case today. It was like the next <laughs> no. one in the list. <laughs> exactly. An unidentified female had been dumped not far from the road, the the highway, that okay. scenic highway. Her shirt had been pulled up and her jeans had been pulled down. Mm. So little trigger warning if if sexual assault is a is an issue for you, there is I'm gonna not go into details, but there mm-hmm. is sexual assault on this one. So her shirt had been pulled up, her jeans had been pulled down. You can kinda 
Yeah, get what Figure out why. Mm -hmm. She had been severely beaten and there was a rope around her neck. Ah, that's horrifying. Right. Police suspected that she had been sexually assaulted and strangled. You know, of course, on the scene, they don't know for sure, but it certainly looked that way. As they processed the scene, they collected a hair, like a, like a, from a head. I didn't know Whoa. a different way to say it, but it wasn't a like a, hair. it wasn't like a body hair it wasn't a or pube. like a pube. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. It was like, Look it was a head giant hair. pube, Bill. God damn it. I always get the ones with the pubes. Ooh, yeah. Gross, 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 gross. No, it was the hair from someone's head. Okay. Um, they also found a small red Swiss army knife and a set of headphones from a Walkman. Oh, oh, oh. When you were going with small red, I was like, uh, because I was still thinking of hair. Small red pube. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So what did they find? <laughs> it was a Swiss army knife. Oh, Swiss army knife. Okay. Swiss ar- right. Get your head out of the pubes. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want my head in the pubes. You do not want your head in the pubes. No. Okay. So red Swiss army knife and a set of headphones from a Walkman. Okay. 90s, you know. I yeah, know absolutely. Then they noted that the button fly of her acid wash jeans, oh, 1990, so right? 90, right? okay. Yep. Had been torn away. So I saw pictures. Mm. So picture your acid wash jeans and they had a button fly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Those, and it takes forever to button back up when you're in the bathroom oh my God. and you're yeah. trying if to get you, done. Right. If you have to pee, just uh, <laughs> like you better give yeah. yourself enough time. And so, yeah, like the the part... So there's the part that has, you know, the the buttonholes, and then the mm-hmm. other half has the actual buttons on it. Right. That piece was, like, ripped away, the part Oof. with the buttons on so, it. So somebody ripped it real quick. Yeah. Or they were in a hurry or we're not yeah, going to. Yeah, something. The young woman had no identification on her. Oh. They did an autopsy. They did confirm that she had been sexually assaulted and that the, her cause of death was strangulation. Okay. So, so that's what it looks made, like. Right. So they made, a, they made a sketch of her, which looked absolutely nothing like her. Oh, no. <laughs> and I feel like that was part of how it took them a while to identify her because uh, she she looked nothing like the sketch. It was a horrible that, sketch. Yes. Well, now that we have like Photoshop and stuff, they should just like make sketches in the, you know, like, right, yes. here's a picture. We're just going to make sketch of the picture. Of, well, you know, whenever photos. they make sketches from like witnesses, they're always really, really bad. Oh, like, yeah. They actually had her. Like they had her right. there. <laughs> It should have been have, a little better, you have right? time to sit there and hopefully draw it out. But right. Yeah. Like let's. Maybe their artists aren't paid well, so they just hire high school. Maybe that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. Okay. So over a week later, on January 31st, Michelle White was watching the news when they aired a sketch of a young woman police needed to identify. She was totally not familiar to Michelle. Michelle's yep. like, nope, don't know that woman. Oh, God. But when they they showed pictures of the victim's shoes and clothes, mm. then Michelle knew immediately it was her younger sister, Tanya. <gasps> oh, no. So it took showing pictures of her. Yeah, That's how far clothes. off this sketch oh, was. No. <laughs> her sister was like, nope, don't know her. Oh, no. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah, that's pretty bad. So 23-year-old Tanya Bennett lived with her family in Portland, Oregon. She was outgoing and friendly. She had an active social life, was always listening to music, especially Mm -hmm. Madonna. Uh, But who wasn't with their Walkman, Mm -hmm. right? Um, She was actually the first of their family to graduate high school. Wow. But she was actually intellectually disabled. Holy cow. Even more power to her, right? Yeah, even with that, she powered through. Awesome. So, but because of her intellectual disability, she was pretty naive Oh, okay. And she had issues with impulse control. Gotcha. So, but she's very friendly. She's very outgoing. She had an active social life. She acted, she acted or she very much wanted to be just a typical 23 year old woman. Yeah. Even though she was still living at home and all this. And she had friends and stuff. She wasn't really forthcoming with her family about who she was seeing or who she was hanging out with. Cause again, she was like, well, I'm 23. I don't know. Yeah. I'm an adult. Tanya had last been seen by her family on Sunday, January 21st, which is the day before her body was found. So her body was found Monday morning. So they saw her on Sunday. All she said was she was going out to see her friends. And they said, well, hey, we have videos due probably at like Blockbuster or whatever. So can you take those back? So she grabbed the videos, right? Yeah. And she left, as usual, wearing her Sony Walkman. 
Okay. She wore it everywhere she went. She was just constantly listening to it. And she headed for the bus. She didn't drive. So she took the bus. And apparently when she was leaving, she was listening to her current favorite song, which was Back to Life by Soul to Soul. Back to life. Back, back to, to reality. reality. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Are you there? Can you feel I'm, it? Are I'm, you there? I'm in it. I am in it. I am I thought that would help. We're on the bus. <laughs> Tanya had been known to go out and not return home for a few days. Like, she really oh. was like, I am an independent person. Oh. So that must have been incredibly frustrating for her family who oh was just gosh. trying to keep her safe. Yes. And they're like, like oh, my God, she's over 18. Yeah. What do you do? Like, right. you, oh, you try to teach them well, but if they're... Yeah. Intellectually disabled a little bit. It's going to be hard to like convince or impulse them control. Too. I mean, oh my that's God. like a, like a typical, like maybe like, like 14 teen. or 15 year mm-hmm. old who doesn't think far enough ahead to consequences and things. Oh, oh yes. Right. This is bad, but is. she's associating with adult people. Right. I mean, this Ugh. is just, it's not good. Not a good recipe. So, okay. So her family wasn't really alarmed when she didn't return Sunday night and they're like, you know, and then Monday came and went and they're like, Okay. Yeah. Um, she liked keeping her personal life private from her family. Wow. They didn't, yeah. So they didn't know who she went to go meet that night. They didn't know where she went. They didn't know. <sighs> they, they knew nothing. Yeah. What can you do? Police discovered that Tanya was a regular at this neighborhood bar. And a waitress told police that she remembered Tanya being at the bar on Sunday night playing pool with two guys. She didn't necessarily know who the guys were. Okay. Just, yeah, like playing Everything pool. seemed normal. She was very friendly. She would come in. She would say hello to people. She would hug people. She was very, you know. Okay. Um, she was a regular. The waitress didn't know when Tanya left, and she didn't know if she left alone or with the guys or whatever. She just, like, uh, I can tell you she was here. Yeah. You know, she was waitressing. She was doing her thing, right? Right. So police were finding nothing but dead ends. They couldn't figure out where she went from the bar. They were finding mm. the guys. I believe they found the guys, but wow. nothing came like they were nothing came of it. Yeah, we just played a game. That's it. Right. Yeah. They're like, no, that was that was it. So after a few weeks, they started an anonymous tip line on crime steppers. Wow, they did. With yeah, Gruff like, the yeah. the dog. Right. McGruff, the dog, yeah. McGruff, that's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's right. very helpful. He is. He's yeah. All of a sudden, one day, a call comes in from a woman saying that she overheard a man named John Sosnovsky. Oof. That took me a while to master. Wow. Yeah, Sosnovsky he did good. Mm-hmm. Bragging that he had killed Tanya Bennett. Oh, that's always a good sign. Because that's what you want to do in public mm-hmm. is brag about that, right? Yeah. So uh, they get this tip and they they look up this John Sosnovsky. Sos- <laughs> <laughs> I was doing so good. Sosnovsky. Yeah, I have it, like, <laughs> written out for myself and everything. Sosnovsky. Uh, he was a 39-year-old lumber yard worker. He had multiple DUIs. Oh. And police discover that at the time, like right now, he is out on parole for his latest DUI. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm, how does he keep getting his license back? That's a know. great question. Mm. Stop giving him his license. Yeah. Of course, he'd probably drive without it anyway. They're like, okay, so we got this guy. This guy's in the system. So they reach out to his parole officer, okay. and they're told that it's that the anonymous female caller was probably his girlfriend, oh. whose name was Laverne Pavlinak. This oh, story in their names, I'm you telling guys. you, Pavlinak. Okay. <laughs> uh, Lorraine Pavlinak was his live-in girlfriend. So oh, the okay. parole officer is like, mm, it's probably Laverne. She she tends to call in on him. But she stays with them anyway. Right? right? This is, this is, it's a really weird story. Okay. So John is 39. Laverne was 57. They were 18 years. There was 18 years difference Mm. in their age. She's mommy. Like a full Mm -hmm. grown person who can join the army. (laughs) In between them. Right? Yikes. Okay. Their 10-year relationship, they'd been together for 10 years, Wow, um, has been described by others as codependent, dysfunctional, mm. volatile. That's just shocking. A, a great time. Mm. A great time. That sounds great. Laverne had called John's probation officer several times to report him for drinking uh, mm. when he's on out on parole for DUI. Oh, no. To express concern that he was very unpredictable, that she was worried he was becoming violent. Oh, my God. So she's, like, just tattling, tattling, yeah, tattling, yeah, yeah. tattling, right? So either shit or get off the pot, maybe. Right, yeah. Police interview Laverne, and she admits that she herself had been the one who heard her boyfriend John bragging about killing Tanya. Wow. 
and that they had been at this place called JB's Lounge and Truck Stop. That sounds high class. It, very, classy. Very classy, classy place. It's a classy place. And so she said that she was sitting there while John was bragging to somebody else at the bar. Oh, about God. This. Yeah, spread the rumors, dude. Right. So Laverne also said that on the night that Tanya was killed, John came home in the middle of the night, mm. went straight to the bathroom and showered. Which Yikes. was very unusual for him, or m- most people, I would Yeah, say. I, I don't you know. know too many that do that. Too many people that are, yeah. Laverne was very friendly, gentle. They described her as very grandmotherly. I mean, pictures of her, she's very grandmotherly. It was a very odd, they were like the <laughs> Weird ultimate combo. odd couple. It was, <laughs> he easily could have been her mother. It was, it was weird. Like, it's not like she dressed and looked and acted as though she was younger. No, mm, she was, no. <laughs> was full on grandma. So he needed a mom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ugh, just gross. Mm-hmm. So Laverne was very accommodating and helpful to police. She told police that she was afraid of John, especially when he drank. Great. The police are like, okay, I think we're on to something here, mm-hmm. right? We got a really good lead. So they obtained a search warrant for the home of Laverne and John. And they were specifically looking for Tanya Bennett's purse and a, and the piece of denim that had been ripped away oh, right. from the fly of her jeans. They're like, these are the two things for sure we're looking for okay. that, was, that were on the warrant. All they found looking through everything was a scrap of paper that had in pencil like scribbled T. Bennett, good piece. <laughs> right? I was like, oh, that's so vulgar. Oh, <laughs> and that's it. They couldn't identify the handwriting. It was just kind of like chicken scratch on a on a uh, piece of paper. Uh, so it could have been anyone that wrote that, maybe. Right. And that's all they found. Right. So they're like, okay, so we don't have any like yeah, that really good evidence here. Yeah. So can't arrest him. They bring John Sosnovsky. They bring him in for an interview. And he denies having ever met Tanya or having any knowledge of her death. He's like, of I don't course. know this girl. I I don't remember talking to her. I don't have anything. Yeah. He was very clear. He was very calm. He told police he would do whatever he needed to clear his name or to help with the investigation because he had nothing to hide. He's like, I am not involved in this at all. All right. Let's see it, dude. Right. He even supplied a sample of his hair so they could compare it to, (laughs) right, of his red pube, (laughs) his head hair to match to the other head hair that they found. (laughs) I, I found nothing about pubes. Oh, thank God. At least it wasn't in any of the articles. <laughs> so so they took those and they sent them off to the forensic lab because God knows how long that takes. It's yes, not like back then, especially CIS yeah. or any of that. CSI takes time. And, you know, so then they let him go home. All they did was interview him. Right. right. Yeah. So a few days later, Laverne calls again. Oh, shit. Calls the police. I, I swear in the pot. I feel like she's got them like on speed dial. Yeah. Or something, she's you know, like <laughs> she's just like <laughs> she's like. Hey, Siri, call number one. Okay, so she calls again, and she's like, okay, so I just want to let you know that John told me that he's the one who wrote T. Bennett good piece on the scrap of paper. Okay, Laverne, I'm I'm kind of not trusting you anymore. <laughs> right? You're kind of seeming right. suspect yourself. And they're like, okay, you know, we, we can't we can't really use that as evidence, but yeah. thanks. Yeah, okay, cool. hearsay. She's, like, calling a lot. Like, okay. she's just, you know. You know, if you want out of this relationship, there's other ways. There's, right? Right. Okay. A few days after that, she calls again. Oh, Laverne. Oh, God. And says that she's she found a strange purse in the trunk <gasps> of her car. Okay. And inside the purse, there were newspaper clippings about Tanya Bennett's murder. That's weird. And that she found a scrap of denim. How convenient. Wow. Right? <laughs> so obviously the police told her exactly what they needed to find. It was on the warrant. Oh, shit. Okay. All right. Let's see this purse. Police get a call from the forensics lab saying that John's hair was consistent with the hair found on the body. This is 1990. Everything wasn't as advanced as it is now. Yeah. All they could say was it's consistent. Right. It looks you know. like it could match. They've got right. They've got a, a it's a follicle. Good, right. It's got a follicle. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not enough evidence to corroborate oh. Laverne's story. John is brought in to take a polygraph test. Oh, gosh. He fails. Oh, 
Wow. All right. Well. So detectives tell John, look, you lied about having knowledge of Tanya's murder. That's what the polygraph says. Yeah. Okay. Uh So John, John, we know drinks a lot. He's an alcoholic and he has frequent blackouts where he drinks to where he doesn't remember what he did. Oh, right. This this is a problem when you're being accused of murder and you can't say where you are. Uh Oh, I might have. I don't know. He writes out a seven page statement, not like a paragraph, like a seven page statement. And he reads it to detectives and they record it as he's, you know, so he writes out this whole script for himself and then he records it. He admits that he recognized Tanya Bennett as a woman that he had seen several times at the JB Lounge, including the evening of January 21st. He says he remembers seeing her there. On that night, he said that he played darts with his friend, whose name was Chuck Riley, Hmm. and that he saw Tanya leave the bar that night with a guy. He didn't know Hmm. what guy. Okay. And then later that night, John asked his friend Chuck for a ride home, and he said in the back seat of the car, he saw the body of an adult white female (laughs) wrapped in a blanket in the back seat of Chuck's car. Okay, that, no, oh, what's that? Oh, okay, we'll just hey, drive home. Not, Thanks. <laughs> right, like, it was just, yeah, I did, I saw a body. <laughs> I didn't say anything, because I didn't want to pry. Right, exactly, <laughs> just, you know, just like, yeah, I noticed that he had a pair of boots back there. Like, just yeah, no, like. It was just a body, I mean, it happens, you know. Dating facts, just oh, dating facts. Right. I find that so weird, so. So weird. So police immediately go out and find this Chuck Riley, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Chuck Riley is like, I have nothing to do with Tanya Bennett. I have nothing. In fact, you guys can go search my car right now. That was a different body, okay? That was so <laughs> totally different body. <laughs> so he's like, no, like you guys don't need a warrant or anything. Like, go, go look yeah. at my car right now. Yeah. So they they do, and there's no evidence that Tanya, a body of any kind, his <laughs> car was trashed. Okay. Like, oh yeah, yeah, it was like trashed. <laughs> right? Yeah, you would have. You would have. Yeah. <laughs> But I found some. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so they're like, okay, this is not, okay. Um, there's nothing in here. We'd find something. There'd have oh, to be absolutely. something in here, right? Yeah. And so they give Chuck Riley a polygraph test and he passes. So if he doesn't really seem to know anything about it. All right. right. This is all very confusing. Uh-huh. There is still not enough evidence to arrest John. Oh, no. Because they're going by what Laverne keeps right. saying. Then right. he accused his friend. There's no evidence for his friend. He failed a polygraph. But yeah, that's... but they don't really have anything on him. Right. So detectives obtain a warrant to put a wire in John and Laverne's home. Ooh. And they ask Laverne to try to get John to talk about the murder and implicate himself. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. It doesn't really work. Oh. Like, she's talking about it and he's like... I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't know. He's like, I don't have anything to do with this. Somebody's trying to pin this on me. Who's pinning this on me? Uh. Like, and she's like, well, this is like the worst thing you've ever done. And he's like, I (laughs) didn't do anything. Like, it's (laughs) awesome. It's very weird. It's almost like, like she was gaslighting him. It was very weird. Uh, Oh, yeah. She sounds a little manipulative. In the meantime, police asked Tanya Bennett's mother to identify the purse that Laverne found in her car. Oh, good. This was what I was going to ask about. And her mother doesn't recognize it. She's uh-huh. like, I don't know what this is, but this does not belong to Tanya. It was similar, but it wasn't her purse. And so then the crime lab analyzes the scrap of denim that they found with the purse. Yeah. And it doesn't match Tanya's jeans. It is not the same acid-washed <laughs> button fly. It's Burn. just... It's just a random scrap of denim. Oh, no. She goes to the the store. Right. I I don't need a yard. I just need a square inch. Right. Exactly. I just need. Right. Oh, no. So police are like, Laverne is fabricating evidence. Yeah. Why is Laverne fabricating (laughs) evidence? This is really. Oh, no. Odd. And. Totally messing up the investigation they could be doing. Exactly. Time. They're like, police are like chasing their tails, uh, like for no cutting reason. down this stuff. And she's coming up with all this. It was very weird. Ah, uh, that's bullshit. Laverne. But she's this like matronly 
motherly, sweet. Like she's not what you would. So expect. she seems trustworthy and like right. want to believe her. This is very. This is very. This is just mm-hmm. really weird. Laverne is confronted and she admits that she planted the fake evidence based on information she read in the paper and heard on the news. Oh God, great. And she said she was trying to help police arrest John because she knew he was the killer. So <laughs> well, she's like, look, helping. I knew he did it. So mm. I'm just giving you guys a helping hand with fake evidence. <laughs> All that's doing is messing it up more, hon. <laughs> I know. This Knock is it like, off. This is a disaster. Oh, shit. Laverne finally admits that she knows that John is the killer because she was there. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. She tells them that in the middle of the night on January 21st, she received a phone call from John saying he was in trouble Mm -hmm. and needed her to come quickly and meet him at J&B's truck stop and to bring something large to wrap something in. Hmm. Which I feel is a very general That's statement. That's very to big. Say. Like, how big are we talking? <laughs> right, That's... bigger than a bread box. What do you need? Give me some. <laughs> give me some parameters here. <laughs> Measurements, maybe. When she arrived, John was hiding between two large trailers, and next to him <laughs> on the ground was a young woman wrapped in a blanket. Jesus. Okay. Oh, la la la! Hurry up. So Laverne tells police that she recognized the young woman because she used to work at a state mental hospital and Tanya Bennett had been a patient there. Hmm. So had she? she recognized. Yes, yeah, oh. she did. She actually did work at. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. She sees the woman on the ground. She knows it's Tanya. Mm. She, asked Ta- she asks John if Tanya is okay. because She's laying on the ground in a blanket. And he says, no, she's dead. Oh, shit. Um, Called the cops? I don't know. No, instead she asked, why Mm. is she dead? And John said, because I choked her. Oh, okay, honey. What should we do now? (laughs) I'm glad that we've (laughs) hashed this all out now. So do we go for a drink first or get rid of the body first? Right. What do we do? So he tells Laverne, you need to help me get rid of this body. Oh, God. So, of course, the Mm -hmm. only thing she could possibly do is... Uh, help him, I guess. The only choice I had was to put it in my trunk. I don't know. So oh, together they rolled Tanya in a blue shower curtain that Laverne had brought with because he said <laughs> to bring something. Yeah. They put her in Laverne's car and they disposed of her body along the old Columbia River, old Columbia River Highway in the gorge. Okay. And Laverne agrees to show police the area where the body had been dumped. She's like, I can show you where we dumped the body. Well, if there were pictures in the newspaper... She might know where You're to so put smart, it. You're so smart, Kelly. You're so smart. <laughs> so she led them to the exact location where Tanya Bennett's body had been found. And with that, police arrest John Sosnovsky. Oh, she finally achieved it. <sighs> right? So God. he finally gets arrested. But wouldn't she be an accomplice? So, <laughs> so he's arrested. And then she says, wait, there's more. Oh, no. <laughs> she wants to make sure he's in there longer. I, right? I, I yeah. mean, I just feel like that was really crazy. She says, I got more to share with you. I didn't just help John after the murder. I helped with the murder. <gasps> oh. Like she just keeps. She, wow. Honey, <gasps> stop. Anything that you say can and will be used yeah. against you in yeah. court of law. You're probably no, going to get in trouble. She's oh, just no. a chatty Kathy. She's just. Oh. Bah, 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 bah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> So she agrees to make a recorded statement and changes her story to say when she went with, when she went to J&B's truck stop, mm-hmm. John was in the parking lot and Tanya Bennett was there standing with him. So she's alive. Oh, okay. Okay. John tells Laverne, hey, we got to give Tanya a ride home. And I guess she was cool with that. I, again, this is her boyfriend. It's the middle of the night. Sure. We're going to give this other chick a ride home. Why not? Ugh. She says as they're driving down the highway, John and Tanya start arguing. Oh, weird. And John tells Laverne to pull over into the parking lot of there's a scenic outlook point called the Vista House there, where like tourists and people go to get a yeah, good picture get of the, the good porch. Pics. Yeah. So she pulls into the parking lot of the Vista House and that John gets a rope out of the trunk of the car and ties Tanya up. Because that's normal. That's a good reaction. 
it's going to make it, he's, he's planning to sexually assault her. Ah. And so he's going to tie her up. Right. And Laverne's like, okay, honey, whatever you want. Right? This is so freaking weird. Ugh. So he asked Laverne to tie the rope around her neck and choke her as, ah, he's, as he's assaulting her. Exactly. <sighs> right? And, and Laverne does it. Good job, Laverne. You're such right? a great grandma. <laughs> so God. please have it on tape. Laverne saying that he kept saying to pull the rope tighter, and she did. Oh, my God. And that eventually Tanya went limp. And so Laverne believes that she was the one who actually caused her strangulation. Oh, my God, Laverne. Why did she try so hard to get John arrested? All of this is such a hot flipping mess. This is a bizarre story. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. She said that after that, they put Tanya back in the car, drove to the location where they dumped the body. So police arrest Laverne Pavlenak <laughs> She's like, for what? her part in the murder. Right. What, what did I do? <laughs> so I thought we'd take a break here for a minute and yeah. just kind of ponder. How, her stupidity. <laughs> this ridiculous. He's already arrested. Shut you your don't, face. You don't need the attention. Maybe she does. Welcome to the Occult and Crime Academy. I'm John. And I'm Jessica. Our podcast entails everything from the paranormal and mysterious to murdery and comedy. If you are looking to sit back, relax, and have a few laughs while learning something new, we are here to drag you through the depths of the world while leaving you hanging in thought. Come join us on our favorite platform to listen anytime and for more information on upcoming shows and how you could be a part of our show. She had the big Coke bottle glasses and the yes. short permed hair. Oh, that's what I was imagining. Was and she's a little hair. more heavy set. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Matronly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, mm, right. Hot. Hot. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so there isn't a lot of background information on Laverne. The best I came up with was that she grew up in Oregon. She was happily married to at least three children. I know she had a son and two daughters. Oh, okay. There may have been more. Like, there is, like, like no information on this woman whatsoever. Weird. So, but that she was happily married, or so she thought. Uh Uh-oh. And then she was completely blindsided when her husband of 26 years decided to divorce her. Wow. And then found out that the reason was because he wanted to be with another woman. Oh, 26 years. That's a long time. Yeah. So, and I guess she had, this was totally out of the blue for her anyways. Mm. She was clueless. This was. Hmm. So this totally turns her whole life upside down. Yeah, for sure. Again, I, I had a hard time finding dates. All I know is that. Not long after, she found love again and remarried. Oh. Okay. And this wasn't John? No. Oh. This was to the man whose last name was Pavlinak. Oh. That's how she gets her last name. But unfortunately, this wasn't meant to be either because they'd only been married for a short time when he passed away of cancer. Oh. That's sad. Like it's... (laughs) Oh. She's... It's... She's... And then... Her son passed away due to medical reasons. So I don't know. It wasn't an accident or anything. Something happened medically and he passed away. So she is just in a horrific mental state. She's totally messed up. Yeah. Right. So she's not in a good place. And this is what her adult daughters say led her to start a relationship with John Sosnovsky. Oh, she needed a bad boy in her life. <laughs> she was, she was, they said she was in a bad place. She didn't have anyone to take care of. She didn't want to be alone. Uh, and John, even though he was 18 years younger, mm-hmm. I guess she had met him previously because he used to work for her late husband. Oh, gotcha. So they oh. kind of knew each other, but then they started up a relationship. relationship. Oof. That I mean, even when they sit next to each other, and there's a picture of them next to each other on the couch. It is a oh, weird no. coupling. It's very odd. <laughs> hmm. There's the age difference. John was an alcoholic. He mm-hmm. was known to have blackouts. The relationship was very abusive, very codependent. It was Ugh. just bad. It was not a good situation. 
They were together for 10 years. That's insane to me. Right? That's a she, long She's very time. loyal, I guess. I guess, say. yeah. But also she tattles on him to yeah, his old officer the all the time. Maybe so not. it's not like she She's, was all on the, you know, innocent yeah, in the situation here. No. I don't know. It's very weird. And obviously she's enabling. Right. Right. So. So confused. So after 10 years, Laverne decided she wanted out of this relationship. Okay. There's ways out. For whatever reason, she was unable to leave him. Apparently she made attempts, but they just didn't work Mm. out. Wasn't a lot of information on that. Yeah, whether it was money or something. But she felt trapped. Okay. That's when she got this idea that the best way to rid herself of John was to send him to prison. <laughs> that seems very difficult. <laughs> it seems like he would he was on that road himself anyway. Right. I mean, she just decided to nudge him a bit, she, I guess. She wanted to push it. Oh, shit. You know how they say, like, um, careful if you date Taylor Swift? Because, you know, she'll write a song about oh, you. Oh, right, right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, don't date Laverne because no. she will put your ass in jail. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a whole she will step find further. A way. Oh. Right. And and get you arrested for murder. Not just oh, like, not just know. being a drunk driver right, repeatedly. Exactly. No, no. She will oh. Yeah. So don't okay. don't cross her either. So Taylor, don't get any ideas. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> So she began calling John's parole officer to report things he was doing that violated his parole. Which obviously his parole officer is like Mm-hmm. Lady, like, don't you have anything better to do? Yeah. Like, she's just he's nitpicking. Like, Dude. Right? And so that's not working. He's not getting sent to jail. Then she called the FBI because she said that John matched the description of a bank robber that she saw in the news. <laughs> Only there was nothing to tie him to this situation oh, no. at all. But oh, again, no. she derailed them. Uh, yeah. A tip. Oh, no. Just creating havoc everywhere right. she goes. So they rule him out as a suspect there. Oh, my God. So then when the news started reporting that they needed help solving the murder of a young woman found in the Columbia River Gorge. Mm. She's like, oh, look at this opportunity. Right. Dropped in my lap. Laverne decided to do whatever it took to ensure that John was arrested for it, even if it meant implicating herself. That's really stupid. I uh, What? Right? Uh, Why? What a Why would ass. you do okay. that? And he was already arrested. Yeah. And then she kept and then going. She, <laughs> girl. I, oh, she must have liked the attention or something. She admitted that she used information from newspaper articles, you know, news reports, wherever she could get her information. And apparently when the police were searching her property, she snuck a look at the warrant Oh, this asshole. Yes. So that's how she found out about the purse. That's how she found out about the denim. Although, I mean, <sighs> there's especially in the 80s and 90s, it's not like denim was just straight blue. No. There was acid no, no. wash, stone yeah. wash, you know, uh, all kinds of, <laughs> you know. Totally. So the odds that she was going to guess the exact exactly right. yeah. what and that whatever scrap she had was going to line up. I mean. I, it, I don't think she clearly thought this through. Uh, first of all, if you're going to try to implicate someone in the murder, you should probably have just any kind of basic knowledge about forensics right. at all. Like, you can't just go, here's a pair, here's a piece of jeans material. Yeah, here's the guy. Pretty sure this is the guy. I, no. I, it's uh, mm. so weird. When she was asked to identify the spot on the highway where the body had been buried. Yes. Like, police really thought that that was like... I mean, this is a long, winding highway okay. where for miles, everything looks pretty much the same. So, and she like, was like, nope, it's here. Right. Okay, and they're like, so she had to have been here. She had yeah. to have been here. She found the exact location. Uh, I guess Laverne looked for a spot where it was obvious it had been disturbed recently. Okay. Well, that's so pretty smart. I have this quote from her. I had seen all these tracks and all this and that. I knew it had to be around there someplace. You could tell where people had been in and out, the vehicles and everything else. Limbs broke. Mm. I just said, this is close enough. Oh, my God. And she freaking got it right. I I mean, it makes sense. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, no. Right? Laverne. So now she's arrested, right? And she gets an attorney and she tells him, what would you say if I told you I made the whole thing up? 
And he was like, I wouldn't believe you. And you're probably and, going to jail now. For... Right. And he didn't believe her. Oh, my God. For the longest time. <laughs> That's hilarious. Her defense <laughs> attorney's like, nope, you're guilty. <laughs> Are you kidding me, lady? Like, hmm. So in January of 1991, so it's like a full year after finding Tanya, Laverne Pavlinak's trial begins and she pleads not guilty. Okay. And she says her defense is that she made everything up to get out of an abusive relationship. Oh which God. this is the most extreme. Really extreme. <laughs> I mean, right? Uh. Her lawyer said in court, he pointed out every single inconsistency that there was between Laverne's evidence and her changing, yeah. sto- I mean, her constantly changing stories that she had the denim, but it wasn't a match that she found the purse, but it wasn't the oh purse. And, God. you know, all this yeah. stuff. So he lays it all out. She changed her story. Right. All this kind of stuff. Like, yeah. this is, right? But the jury got to hear her taped confession <gasps> where they recorded her saying that she had the rope and she kept pulling uh, on the rope until Tanya God. passed out and they convicted her. They were like. Oh, my God. Yep. I mean, if you're going to play with fire, you're going to get burned. Mm. Yeah. So once they heard that, they were like, nope, it was apparently was unanimous. They're like, nope, she is guilty. You know, the other stuff doesn't line up, whatever. She literally confessed. Oh, my God. (laughs) This woman. Yeah. Well, that's what you get. Laverne is found guilty of felony murder and is sentenced to life in prison. Holy shit. Meanwhile, the real killer is out there somewhere. Exactly. Oh. oh, my God, you crazy woman. Okay. So John Sosnovsky was set to go to trial next. And based on the outcome of Laverne's trial and the fact that he had failed a polygraph test, mm. that yeah. he really had no memory of that night because blackouts. Yeah, because he's drinking <laughs> was always. Just like, right. So he honestly was like, I honestly don't know if I did this oh, or not. Like, I don't even shit. know. I don't know. So... He just decides to plead no contest to first degree okay. murder to avoid the death penalty. Wow. Oh they take, they agree to the plea or whatever, and he is sentenced to life as well. Wow. Wow. Now, right? So these two people are in prison for life, and she made the whole thing up. Oh, and we God. still don't know who killed Tanya Bennett. <sighs> See, because so, all that time was wasted. Oh, my God. So much time and Mm -hmm. energy and uh, the court system, like all of that. Absolutely. Money. So here's a fun little twist. Okay. Shortly before Laverne's trial began, there were graffiti messages found in two bathroom stalls. No. And these bathroom stalls were nowhere near the Portland, Oregon area where this trial was taking place. One was in eastern Oregon and the other bathroom stall was all the way in Montana. Okay. But both of these... Bathroom stalls had graffiti written on them with somebody res- claiming responsibility for Tanya Bennett's murder. Ooh, that's creepy. So I have a picture of one of them, like in pen on the stall wall or whatever. Ugh. It says January 2190. That's the day that she died or that they okay. found her. That's the morning they found her. No, that was the night that she went out and they found her the next morning on the 22nd. Killed Tanya Bennett in Portland. Jesus. Two people got the blame so I can kill again. Ah, that's and horrifying. Then underneath it in parentheses, it said, cut buttons off jeans proof. <gasps> wow. Right? Okay, so here's my question. Was it the men's bathroom or the women's bathroom? <gasps> they did not specify. <gasps> they didn't Yikes. specify. They just said bathrooms. Oh, creepy, creepy. So, but this is kind of found, but like the trial is like ready to go. This is nowhere like... Uh, it really wasn't admissible. There wasn't any reason to bring it up. Like they had oh the people. God. It was right. like, they're oh like, eh, God. what do we care? <gasps> right. So oh they went to prison at the beginning of 1991. Right. Mm-hmm. In March of 1995, the person actually responsible for Tanya Bennett's murder confesses. Mm. Oh my God. <laughs> A serial killer who had been free to go on and murder eight more women (gasps) because of Laverne Pavlinak's false confession. Freaking Laverne. Laverne, look what you did. So this person was out for five years, killed Uh, eight more people, serial killer. Yes. Oh, my God. 
So Mm -hmm. that was in March of 1995. This person confesses. I'm not going to tell you who it is yet. Okay. In November of 1995, a judge releases Laverne and John from prison. Like, eh, he shouldn't be out there, but (sighs) God. Well, John's sentence was vacated. Oh. The judge ruled that his no contest plea violated his constitutional rights because Mm. it had not actually been voluntary since he was facing the death penalty. I know, mm. I read that like three times. I didn't totally get it. But yeah, basically yeah. they're like, okay, you're you're released and you're innocent, basically. You're innocent, right? Yeah. But Laverne's conviction was not vacated. Oh my God. <laughs> so she's out, but they said that there was no constitutional defect with her trial because she was convicted by a jury of her peers. Oh, there was evidence. Wow. She supplied them with the evidence. but Yeah, I mean, she made it up, but right? oh my God. So Judge Paul Lipscomb wrote, quote, Pavlinak has selfishly engaged in an obsessive and persistent obstruction of justice, which deflected the investigation at an early stage, causing it to focus on her boyfriend, Sosnovsky, mm-hmm. while the real killer remained free to kill again and mm-hmm. again. Her persistence in this manipulation resulted in her own conviction. Yeah. So. Absolutely. She would have gotten in trouble either way just for being. Right. Exactly. So they were both in prison for about five years. No, I think they were in prison for four years because it was, it took a year for them to go to court. Oh, right. All I know is that Laverne Pavlinak died of heart failure in March of 2003. Wow. And that John Sosnovsky died in 2013. Don't know why or of what or what happened. Laverne lived till she was 70. I assume they didn't get back together after that. (laughs) You would hope. I don't know. You know, I don't remember. No one actually said, (laughs) but I would assume that she finally at least got away. At least I got out of this relationship. Could you imagine if they were both separated in prison for four years and then they got back together? Oh, no. I I would just convict him just for being stupid. (laughs) God, okay, you're stupid. Right? Go back to jail. I mean, oh she, she easily could have been charged with obstructing justice. And Absolutely. They could have sent her back to jail. Oh, I sure. mean, oh, God. what a bitch. What a so, bitch. So I thought that I was going to end our episode here. And our next episode, I was going to tell you about the real <gasps> killer oh of God, Tanya Bennett. Yes. Um, a serial killer who has a very interesting story. So I'm going to. Oh, yes. It's a two parter. I like two parter. It's a two parter, you guys. It's a two yes. parter. And uh, and we can uh, thank Laverne Ugh. for causing a whole <laughs> separate episode. I'm debating. Right. So I can give you my sources. But if I do that, it might give away some of the stuff for next week. Okay. So, so is we, it safe for us to just save the sources for next week? Yes. So listen yeah. to next week's episode for the sources right. for this one. Right, yeah, right, right. That works. So I'll I'll tell you this. Uh, part of it is from a 2020 episode. Okay. But if I give you the name of the episode, it'll ruin it. So it'll I'm going to tell it. you that. Okay. There's abcnews.go, Wikipedia, The mm-hmm. Cinemaholic, Murderpedia, The Huge. But if I give you the, the – my main source was this awesome 2020 episode. Ooh, but if I okay. tell you that, it's going to – all right. It's just going to ruin all of our fun for next right. week. Right. We'll reveal next week then. Right. So. Yes. Um, oh, thank yeah. you. Ooh, that's this a good is, start. And now I'm going to be at the edge of my seat for do, a freaking week. Do not date Laverne Pavlinak. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> Especially now that she's dead, because that would be really weird. <laughs> be really I, I still wouldn't trust her any further than I could throw her. I don't know. I mean. But you could probably throw her pretty far by now. Yeah. And bones. In this, in this 2020, her adult daughters, like, talked about her, and they're going on and on about how, like, she was so sweet and normal and a great person and all this, well, like, all hmm. the way up until, like, her life kind of took a turn, and then, like... And then it just went shit show central. Holy crap. <laughs> right? They're like, oh, no, she wow. was the greatest lady, and I'm like... Was she? I just. Yes. I, Maybe she, it was just brewing underneath and just bam. So totally. So there's ways out of abusive relationships, but yeah. it's not easy. That's for sure. But boy, right. she created a whole new, new path. Of yeah. Wrongness. I mean, but honestly, 
She could have stopped halfway through. He probably still would have been convicted. Yeah, she didn't have to go to jail. Yeah, she's. It's just, and then it was like, how messed up is it that she actually created this entire scenario where she helped with the murder? Yeah. What did she think was going to happen to her? Right. Of course you're going to be implicated. And how sick and twisted that she came up with the whole murder scene. Yeah. I mean. Really creepy. Well, and then she's like, well, but he told me to do it. Maybe that's what she was thinking. Like, maybe I can put it all on him because he said I had to. Yeah. Good story. Can't wait to hear the conclusion. Yes. Again, hopefully, hopefully next time there will be less clearing of my throat. Ah, you'll and be my good. throat, my voice won't be so scratchy. Let me clear my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. Back so to good. life. Back, back to you. reality. Ooh, let's not. Let's not go back to reality. <laughs> I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm no, not ready. No. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to another fun episode. Oh, yes. Please stay odd, but not as odd as Laverne. Not as odd as Laverne. That is far too That's odd. That's odd. That's, That's taking it a little too. Yeah, little you get a bad far. last name when you do that. All Oi. right. Oi. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Right. Bye. Bye. Hey, Oddies. Thanks for listening to another episode of ODFM. If you're a longtime listener, hey, we cannot thank you enough for your continued support. And if you're a new listener, thanks for giving us a try. If you like us, please drop us a like, subscribe, or rate us so we can share our stories with more people around the world. And if you'd like more information, like links to our podcast and socials, along with our Patreon fan page, those links are all on Linktree under ODFM Podcast. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash ODFM Podcast. Side note. You guys, we're obsessed with fan art, and we love making things with it, like stickers for our fans. So if you'd like us to use your designs, send it to us at odfmpodcast at gmail.com. And if we use your design, we'll be sure to send you a sticker. Thanks for listening to another episode of ODFM, hosted by Kelly DeVries and Jenna Swanson. Production and editing by Kelly DeVries. Theme music by Eric Swanson. ODFM is a satirical true crime podcast for entertainment purposes only. The stories you hear are serious and true. The comments and opinions are not. We apologize if any of our content is harmful or disrespectful. 